thank you very much for coming along. I think it's one of the most important sessions that we do at World Travel Market each year, so it's really great to see an audience here. What I've tried to do with the programme this year is to cast um, the general question about what can we do to make tourism more socially inclusive, and in casting in that way, I've tried to encourage the speakers to look at social inclusion in terms of socially including as many people as possible in the experiences of tourism. There's sometimes a tendency to talk about tourism uh, for people with disabilities in terms of this very wealthy market, um, which for sure exists. But there are also a lot of people who, are, um, who have disabilities but who are not wealthy. And the issue of how everyone um, can have a holiday is important to me and I hope important to you. So I'm going to hand over to John who's going to chair this session. We've got five remarkable presentations, three with PowerPoints and most miraculously of all two without, which we always appreciate. Um, so we're going to have some lively debate, I hope, about how we can move the tourism industry to being more inclusive. Thanks, John. So good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Swarbrook, and I have the pleasure of chairing this afternoon's session. Um, and I have the pleasure of the first speaker calling to the rostrum is Nikki. Go, girl. <laughs> well, after that introduction, <laughs> thanks, John. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you. I'm just going to make a few uh, short remarks um, in terms of my observations from uh, the work we've been doing within ABTA. And... Uh, said some of the challenges that we've been working on and addressing and hopefully said uh, through the experiences shared today looking at where we can move forward uh, further as well. Um, I think as we um, talk about the, the subject matter it's very encouraging to see the subject on the agenda again yet also I suppose very frustrating for those people that um, are impacted by the subject that of the slow progress that sometimes feels like it's being made um, in addressing some of the challenges within tourism and people with disabilities facing uh, the environmental challenges particularly um, that are um, not been addressed to date. Um, in my destinations role I visit quite a lot of different countries um, and there are very different approaches um, an understanding of things like social inclusion and um, working with people who are disabled by their environment and what the priorities and challenges there are. Um, I think sometimes it's useful to look at definitions um, and talking in terms of sort of social inclusion um, just to sort of frame what we're talking about. The European Union very much talk about it's facilitating tourism access for society groups for which going on holiday represents a difficult undertaking. Now that actually has a myriad of different aspects to it and I think some of the, the, the challenges we face is that you use one definition, everybody thinks of uh, one homogenous group and it's anything but um, an, a homogenous group of people with the same type of challenges. Um, I also like to throw in the fact that we're talking very much about people going on holiday but a massive part of what we do is working with the people who work in the tourism industry so just throwing in to think about how we also facilitate opportunities for people in the tourism industry as well uh, that gets little airtime so I just like to throw that out there as well while we're here but back to the subject of those taking holidays and the role of the um, holiday in the UK um, I think sometimes we we just have holidays, we don't uh, stop and think about what is important about a holiday uh, for anyone trying to take one. In the UK in particular, we see it um, as a necessity, um, regardless of any kind of social, economic or health or challenges, we think that we have a right to have a holiday, um, to have a, a different change of scene, to spend more time uh, either with families in a different environment, um, just said having time out. But that's not as easy as it sounds for everybody, and uh, while said, Harold said that for a group of people it's, uh, it's very easy if you've got money to throw at it. There's an awful lot of people that are impacted by challenges that don't necessarily have uh, the funds to spend on um, some of the challenges that we, we do face. So a little bit about our role as an industry. What are we, what are we trying to do to help advance um, some of the challenges? Um, I'm going to touch on um, some, I suppose, they might seem like slightly odd subjects, but actually they're fundamental to how we go about delivering holidays. Um, firstly, in terms of pricing, um, purchasing a holiday is a, a very large financial commitment. Um, and when Harold introduced the subject and said we have people um, who are uh, said facing potentially financial difficulties in terms of managing a holiday, have necessarily saved up for a long time, 
um, to it said get a good holiday. Um, that element is often uh, purchased through perhaps unprotected arrangements. So from Abtus Financial Protection, whilst people might think that's all very much about said just general financial protection arrangements, this is absolutely key when you're booking a holiday and you spend an awful lot of money to make sure that you are using reputable people to book it through and that you know that the holiday that you're expecting is going to be delivered at the other end because unfortunately we hear of an awful lot of instances where people make arrangements, they get promises about what they think the uh, arrangement's going to be in the destination and it's anything but the experience that uh, they had expected. Um, it's also thinking about what are the different options available at different budgets um, rather than just thinking that everybody said has similar sort of funds for holidays. Um, how do we actually make uh, the most of the different type of options out there, thinking about the different um, seasonality? And I think it's there has been some talk about how you extend season, how you make um, uh, different areas available for people who haven't necessarily got so much funds to go at different times of the year. Now, I personally don't think that that's a, an appropriate response because you're talking about a lot of people who potentially have children or it's children uh, with the disabilities um, who might be in school, but they, they said they want holiday at the time of um, when everybody else is going. They can't come out of school, as we well know. Uh, that's not allowed under any circumstances. So to talk about those sort of solutions isn't necessarily um, said a practical solution. So they're just some of the issues around said price purchasing and pricing. Um, in terms of accessibility, again, we talk about people um, very much with uh, physical disabilities um, and mobility issues, but we're seeing more and more in terms of the growth of the aging population and the challenges that the aging population um, face. Um, it, very much, again, by their environment and what's uh, provided for them to be able to enjoy a holiday. There's also the issues um, we see more and more in terms of around mental health, um, and that comes with an ageing population, sadly, that there are challenges that people face. And going on holiday and experiencing in, um, uh, different cultures and different ways um, when you have challenges in that respect is quite terrifying sometimes. And people do go on holidays, they go on cruises, they go on coaches, and well-meaning families often put people on holidays to sort of get a break themselves, but then that uh, brings with it challenges for the operators of cruise and coach companies when you have people with different um, challenges on there and their staff aren't trained necessarily. Um, and I suppose, uh, so to bring you all that together in how we as an industry are trying to work and raising awareness of some issues, it's very much around information and guidance um, and knowledge. I think this is a subject, um, I actually look back at my dissertation that I did about a million years ago when I was at university and I actually looked at hotels and how accessible they were and I'm talking a, a long time ago. <laughs> and I think um, there, are, there are pockets of things happening in the world which are making things better, but they are still pockets. It's not mainstream. And uh, I was talking to a gentleman from Spain last night um, who has been working extremely hard on a, a Spanish initiative in terms of looking at all the different types of hotels and what, the, what type of accessibility they have, and, but very specific, detailed information rather than just said this kind of homogenous grouping of an accessible room. What does that mean if you have different types of challenges? So it's seeing initiatives like that becoming more mainstream is going to be absolutely key. And, and for us to actually understand that information, help members and help people understand, our, our members understand what they can tell their customers and get better information, that's one of the things we've been working on the last um, couple of years, is drawing out information uh, about what the legal framework is so that people don't feel um, uh, scared to ask the wrong information because I think sometimes that comes through from the travel agents, that they're, they're not sure exactly what they are allowed to ask and how to ask it in a positive way. So helping them understand the right kind of questions to help the customer get the best kind of holiday, whatever um, their, their needs are, drawing out the right questions. We've actually developed guidance um, to help people said, work through that um, so that the customer can fill that information and give that to their travel agent, but likewise for the travel agent to ask the right information as well. Um, so we're on a said beginning part of this journey, getting the right type of guidance and sharing experiences. And that's what the last thing I'll touch on is a, a group that we run within ABTA is an advisory group, which is made up of airlines, airport operators, the airports themselves, um, different um, user groups from people with different disabilities, um, tour operators, travel agents, trying to bring together all the different players that put together the overall customer journey and looking at the different challenges that people face and addressing those. And there are many, many different challenges, so we, tr we try and said, progress different issues as we, as we face them. Uh, one of the things we've been working on a lot recently has been about pre-notification. 
Um, but anybody who has uh, tried to pre-notify um, of issues that you might have in terms of said, different types of wheelchair when you arrive at the airport and what your expectations are, you're often let down by the airport or the airline because the information hasn't travelled through. So we've been working really hard with the different bodies to try and make sure that's all joined up. It's not easy, I have to say, and sometimes systems are, are to blame, um, but it's not good enough and we have to keep making changes. So we'll continue to work on these challenges and develop uh, information and facilitate information. The more that we find out things that we can help on, we want to hear about them as well. So that's me. Thank you, John. Thank you very much indeed, Nikki. We're going to take all this. Yeah, sorry. I should have started <laughs> that. <That's sorry. laughs> the plan is, and it's a very ambitious plan, is we take all the, the speeches first and then we ask the questions afterwards. So I think with that, I now hand over to Nicola, who I see has a wonderful presentation, which Harold is going to make happen in an instant. It's happening. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nick. I work at the Special Assistance Department at Virgin Holidays. Um, as Nikki said, there's a lot to be done, but we are moving forward, and I'm just going to show you how it does work. As we all know, um, it does take more. It's not just a thousand steps that can be a barrier. It is really just one that can make you feel excluded. It's an interesting um, 2007 government commission paper um, back in 1999 what people perceived as a very necessary activity. 80% attending weddings and funerals, 84% visiting friends and family, and 19% just for holidays abroad once a year. However, that was 1999 and only 36% of people had a mobile phone. But I think we all know we do travel for different reasons now. Holidays, funerals, weddings, and to see friends. It's been quite interesting to see what the results would look like today. However, Virgin Holidays, we have had a special assistance team since the early 1990s. And barrier to inclusion isn't always about money. 80% of 65 year olds have long term conditions. Actually, 80% of the wealth in the UK is these baby boomers. But Virgin Holidays, we've been doing this for a while. 1969 747 back in the 80s when you can only book from a brochure oh and i first met Rich, richard branson with my shoulder pads <laughs> but we've all moved on since then there's the dreamliner online advertising and booking and a few more wrinkles as i said we've been doing it for 20 years and it really has been working well it's for people with mobility restrictions and medical requirements so what do we do? Well, we support the frontline sales teams and also the retail stores across the country. Um, we have over 100 of those now, popping up all over the place, High Street, Tesco. And we really do provide dedicated support across the brands. It's the same personalized service at all price points, from the Travel City Direct budget brand up to Hip Hotels. We provide it for every single one of our customers. We also have access to a massive database of audit information we've personally collated and this covers all of our long haul destinations worldwide. And we provide customers with a personalised contact and a personal advocate for all of their medical and accessible needs. And this really does set Virgin Holidays apart. We are the only mainstream tour operator to do this. So what do we do? We do obviously we have the special assistance team. We do adapted van hire, accessible transfers, accessible accommodation, hand controls for car hire, um, and medical and mobility equipment hire. And we cover this from the beaches up to the ski slopes. But we're still innovating our services. There's still a lot to be done. And not just because it's the right thing to do. It really does make excellent business sense. Um, our customers love our service. They're really loyal. Um, and they do come back over and over again. We like to have fun. And we do like to screw business as usual. I mean, these are a few recent innovations of ours. Um, I personally introduced the beach wheel wheelchairs into the Caribbean. Um, I found I went on holiday with my family and I never got to see my children build sandcastles or even splash about in the sea. So we've now introduced these into three of the Caribbean islands that we feature and they are free for every single person. Don't have to be a Virgin Holidays customer. If they're available, anyone can use them. Okay. And I've crashed the presentation. There we go. Um, right. We've also re-audited re the Caribbean hotels that we feature. We've personally inspected them all for accessibility. Um, the Caribbean really is a key destination. It's not covered by any of the um, accessibility acts, so we really have to make sure that everything is okay. And this really does support the local tour industry as well, because it, 
you know, benefits everybody. We've also integrated our special assistance details into the website. So you can just tick on the wheelchair friendly box and whenever you want to search for a holiday, the accessible hotels will come up. It gives everyone the right to search and buy online. And this is an example of our integration, integrated information. Ultimate guide to cruising, there's the accessibility box at the top and just some of the information just regarding accessibility. Really simple, but really important information. Um, another thing we're actually really proud of, we've teamed up with Dreams Come True, offering holidays for those with terminally ill children, and really all they want to do is see Mickey Mouse. And we really, really enjoy that. So I think we've all gotten a lot to shout about, but what are the industry priorities? I think we really need to share best practice, address the issues around travel insurance for pre-existing conditions, this really does exclude a lot of people from young to old. We also need to improve access in the air. I mean, the regulations are there for a reason, but they don't need to be a barrier to inclusion. We need to drive the industry overseas through leadership and contracting, making the business mainstream, and continue to invest in inclusion. So finally, a few, a few words from the boss. He really is there to make business a force for good. And Virgin Holidays have our very own responsible business policy. Business is about being accountable to all stakeholders, maximising the benefits, being a successful company, contributing to the economy, most importantly making a positive contribution to society and to help make people's lives better. Thank, Thank you very you. much indeed. Thank you. It's always wonderful to have, if you're an academic like I am, it's always wonderful to have industry speakers because when somebody says to them, speak for six minutes, they speak for six minutes. If you say that to an academic, they'll speak for six hours. Um, could I please hand over then to Lynn, please, the third speaker? I think we're not talking, are we talking PowerPoint? Yes, yeah. very All oh, right, okay. And now we've lost Harold. We've lost Harold. <coughs> but we have a genius man and so on instead of Harold. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Lynn Kirby from Enable Holidays and as you know we're here to talk about social inclusion. Everybody deserves a holiday. The Declaration of Human Rights states that everyone has the right to rest and leisure and it should include the freedom to travel. It's the 10th anniversary of Enable Holidays so I thought we could look at the changes that have been made over the last 10 years, um, and me personally, I've been involved for 10 years, and we identified 10 years ago that the conditions for disabled travellers, the accessibility and the services provided were, well, they just weren't, <laughs> to be frank. So during the last 10 years, things have changed. Um, we've definitely seen changes with greater awareness, better facilities and improved services. Disabled communities have also found their voice and are actively getting involved with travel professionals to ensure services and opportunities continue to improve. I believe the London Paralympics 2012 was probably the most extraordinary event encompassing the inclusion of disabled people. And in my opinion, that captured the imagination and changed the attitude towards, towards the disabled community of every individual in the UK and maybe further afield. So where are we now and how do we build on this legacy? We have, we have actually improved. There are some good things that we can be proud of. Assistance at the airport is better now than ever before. Not perfect, as Nikki will tell you, but it is better with the introduction of ambulifts, stair lifts, and one-to-one -one assistance at the airport.
There is a bigger demand now for all types of holidays, beach holidays, ski holidays, scuba diving, um, many, many different types of activity holidays. The can-do attitude is really working its way through for disabled people, and disabled people really do want to do much, much more than sit on a beach. And at last, people can now travel further afield and enjoy the many magical destinations, such as the Taj Mahal, on the water, off the water, and really, really experience things that disabled people haven't been able to experience previously. So, whilst we have made improvements, we still have a long way to go. Examples of the not so good, and it does sadden me to say that there are still a lot of bad situations. No access into hotels, grab rails installed but not able to reach them, lift doors too narrow, washrooms out of reach, the list goes on. Inaccessible pathways are a regular occurrence in some areas, despite, and also disabled people have to campaign to drop curbs and car parking facilities. I'm on a, currently on a personal mission to um, get parking for adapted taxis at Palmer Airport. Our, our customers at Palmer Airport have to be offloaded off an adapted taxi with suitcases, wheelchairs, etc. And there is, there is no time for the, um, there's nowhere for the taxis to stay. So therefore then people are just left stranded. The ugly. There are some really ugly, unacceptable situations still going on. Customers are left to fend for themselves, as I've just explained, and vehicle, when vehicles can't park, daunting steps in front of the disabled passengers, for, sorry, daunting steps for, for the mother to carry the disabled passenger up the stairs. The horror stories in the media where people's dreams, where people have saved for years to go on holiday, and they just haven't had their holidays fulfilled because the actual crucial facilities that they needed weren't provided for them. So as we approach our second decade in business, I'd like to see the travel industry and the disabled groups work together to form a standard, recognised Define, definition of what is required as an accessible room, what is, de what, what, what is it they, they exactly need. One thing is in Spain means one, something in Spain means one thing and something in the UK means something else. We need to get that, um, those facilities so that we all understand exactly what they mean. We need to provide better online information. 83% of disabled community look online for information and it's not always there. It is better now than it was 10 years ago, but it still has a long way to go. Most hotels only have two to three rooms that are available for adapted people, sorry, adapted for disabled people. And this is just not acceptable. The percentage is less than five, and we really need to build on that. We need to cap, we need to cap, sorry, I can't see that from here. <laughs> yeah, um, somebody touched on it earlier. Wouldn't it be great, as you do with trains, that wheelchair users can get on an aircraft and stay in their wheelchair so that they can do the whole flight without having to be hauled up steps? And even, even with the use of Ambulift, it still it doesn't give them the dignity that they deserve. And I also following on from what Nikki said, would like to see mandatory training in the travel industry so that people do know how to ask the right questions. They do know how to pe treat people with dignity. And they also then, having asked the right questions, know what they need to deliver in order to fulfill their dreams. We're told that this market is worth 80 billion pounds a year. So isn't it time that we gave that market the, dissension, the attention that it deserves? I think that's me finished. Thank, Thank you for you listening. Very much. Thank you. So, so far we've had three presentations from the UK-based industry. We now have Jose, who's come all the way from Brazil to talk to us. Jose, the floor is yours. Yes.
Well, uh, good afternoon. I would like to thank uh, Professor Harold e. Godwin uh, for the invitation to be here today. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is José Fernandes, and I'm an agronomist. Um, sorry. Um, after working for 16 years at a multinational company, I decided uh, to do what I really love, which is to be closer to the nature. Uh, so I moved back to my hometown, Socorro, which is a small town in the state of Sao Paulo. Uh, I've had a farm since 1977, when I moved there about 20 years ago, and I started to work with tourism, and I turned the farm into a hotel. Now it, it has more than six attractions uh, for tourists, like feeding different animals, fishing, picking fruits from the tree, visiting our vegetable garden, uh, sightseeing our, our recycling area, and the adventure activities. All of that in a place surrounded by nature. We reforested all the property to provide more uh, contact with the nature for the tourists. In 2002, I started a new project in a different area of the town, which was totally degraded. This second park has more than 60 uh, attractions, besides the, its beautiful nature with many waterfalls and the mountains. In this scenery, uh, there are seven zip lines, canopy tree tour, upsailing, and other activities. Um, we also reforested all the area and this is how it looks now. Uh, there is a lot I could tell you about the hotel, uh, because we work with about eight different niche markets, but today I will focus on accessibility. Uh, adapting the premises and the signage was the easy part but no one knew how to operate tourism with accessibility. So we volunteered in the project to understand the needs of the people with disabilities. The infrastructure uh, that already existed was adapted. And from that year on, every new building was constructed using the universal access design, and this was good for everyone. People traveling with their pets took advantage of the built-in canal in their accommodation. The new bedroom furniture was accessible for these kids, for the kids, and all the family, it also more affordable to be built. The pool with ramps uh, made it easier for pregnant uh, women, elderly uh, people, and uh, everyone uh, to access. We improved the signage and the communication a lot. Our website is also accessible now, and information is more organized and easier to be found but the adventure activities are what exceeded all the expectation of the people with disabilities, 
by providing them with a unique experience. At our hotel, people who are blind can do canopy tree tour with only the help from a guide. A different procedure ensures them uh, they feel safe and confident to complete the activity. We created a different seat for people who are paraplegic to be able to do the zip line and the abseiling. This seat is also very comfortable for elderly people and everyone. We also innovated, creating this new way to do the zip line. And today it's our most important attraction. We adapted a chair which provides enough safety for a person who is quadriplegic to do rafting. Different bicycles and the rides were developed for different kinds of disabilities, making it po possible for them to go anywhere. Our tractor also gained the, an elevator, so wheelchair users can have easy access to it and go for the sightseeing ride to feed the animals. For horseback riding, we develop, developed a different horse saddle with a backrest and a seat belt to ensure a safe and a comfortable ride. We also developed a ramp for easy wheelchair access uh, to the horse cart. So the person with a disability can ride with more members of their family. And this is just a few of the facilities we offer to the people with disabilities. Uh, all with extra attention, but at extra charge. We do it because we believe everyone deserves to have fun with their families and friends. But we also discovered it was really good business. 45% of the Brazilian population has some kind of reduced mobility or disability. So, um, one person with a disability comes to the hotel with three or four people without a disability. Since they do not have many accessible places to go, we have seen an increase of people with a disability visiting our uh, place. And our uh, occupancy rate is 80% year round, Monday to Monday. So being all inclusive uh, means our place is good for everyone. And the, all the activities and the equipments that we developed um, became a, a better than the uh, user equipments. Thank you for your attention. Jose. Now we have our final presenter. For those who may be not from the UK, our final presenter is a Paralympic medalist and a TV presenter. So Aid is our final presenter of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think you'll all be pleased to, to hear that my presentation will be pretty short. Um, I think I'm, I'm here mainly uh, through my experience um, in travel and uh, I think the major part for me is going to be the Q&A. Um, I've traveled for the last 20 um, years um, through TV, through sport and it's um, opened up many doors for me and I think um, you know, the experiences that I've had 
um, uh, in travel have changed so much over the years. I've I've travelled um, through sport to the Paralympic events to European Championships, um, and I've seen travel go from something that was really obscure for people with disabilities, extremely difficult. Um, you know, it almost seemed like a, a challenge. It was harder than actually competing in the sport to, to get on planes and to get to places to, to today where it's um, where things have moved on. But I, I still find it really weird and crazy that um, in the tech, in this day and age with the kind of technology that we have that for families, it's still a massive, massive chore um, to, to travel abroad. I mean, some of the stats that we've heard today are mind boggling. 80 billion um, pounds, you know, the, the dis disability travel industry is worth. I mean, in this day and age when it's all about money, why are, we, why are you excluding those type of people? And, you know, two years ago, it was already mentioned, two years ago, we had one of the greatest events ever in this country. The uh, Paralympic Games was here in East London and, and, the, and the Olympic Games. and one of the overriding messages is that it's sent out to, to kids and to people uh, of this generation is that um, there are no boundaries on the possibilities, on the things that you can do. You know, that was the message we sent out. And how can we carry on and follow through with that message if the world is not accessible to everybody? Um, I work for a charity, I'm a patron of a charity called Go Kids Go. Um, this charity helps um, to teach disabled kids wheelchair skills. I was there uh, um, last week um, with, uh, with a number of disabled kids from the age of four to, to 15. And I, was speak I spoke to their parents and I said to them, what is it like um, uh, for you when you go on holiday? If you thought about uh, um, going on holiday, what, what, what do you have to go through? And for a lot of them, they say, it's a huge challenge for some of them. They haven't even thought about it. Some of them are preparing. They're saying they're going to prepare for the next four or five years um, in order to, 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 to get the finances right. And in order to, to um, create the, I mean, to create the right environment for their kids to go on holiday. Why? Why is that? Why is that? Why should people just because they have a disability or have some sort of impairment have to make such sacrifices in order to go on holiday so i think if we're going to change things you know you you the people here who can do that you know you the people here who can take the message from here and pass it on into the industry and uh make a give, create a more accessible world thank you so ladies and gentlemen due to the brevity of our speakers we have plenty of time for questions <laughs> so who'd like to be the first question asker please we have two at the front Hiya, Vicky. Um, Aid, you just mentioned um, sacrifices that you make. Um, apologies to anyone that might have mentioned this earlier, but do you find you end up spending more...